production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, Mississippi farmers play catch up as they try to plan on the highest and driest spots. Nothing to pull your hair in the out food factor, way. do you have picky a picky eater, eater in your house? You we'll have some ways to get them to eat. Huge in Southern Gardening, the Southern Indica Azalea. It's everywhere, but this spring bloomer remains popular. In the markets, Pond Bank catfish prices drop from where they were a year ago. And it may be more urgent to sell soybeans rather than corn right now. In the feature segment, we'll look back at the year 2012. It was a big year for animal rights activists and drought. Under pressure from animal rights groups, major pork buyers and major pork suppliers announced various agreements that would end their production of swine housed in gestation crates. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. The wet weather of the past few weeks has let up in some areas and Mississippi farmers are working to play catch up on spring planting. Leighton, surprisingly enough, a lot of progress has been made. There has been less rain in the Delta in some portions of West Mississippi. It goes to show that Mississippi farmers can hit the ground running with today's larger equipment. As with this uh, crop report reflects conditions as of April the 19th, soil moisture that date still surplus in 62% of the state, but adequate though in 37% and actually short in 1% of the state, and that's down in the very southern tip of the state. Mississippi corn, 71% planted as of the 19th, and that is behind the five-year average for the state, but if you look at emergence, 31%, and that all came up between uh, April 12th and April 19th. So. As we look at Mississippi rice, 38% planted as of the 19th, and the average for this uh, date is 36%. So running ahead there, an emergence is running about on par, 19%. As we look at Mississippi soybeans, 32% planted as of the 19th, and that's actually ahead of the five-year average for this state. As we look at emergence, 12% of the crop has emerged, and that's running on par with the five-year average of 9% for the state. Look at Mississippi cotton, of course, things just getting underway there. 3% of the crop is planted, 6% is the average for the state, and none of it has emerged at, as of the 19th. As we look at Mississippi watermelons, 49% of the crop planted as of the 19th, which is only slightly behind the five-year average for the state. Mississippi wheat, only 30% of the crop is headed, and of course that's due to the uh, cooler weather and the moisture of the average for the state is 48%. You probably know some children who turn their nose up when any healthy food is placed in front of them. These children may in fact live at your house. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes of the Mississippi State Extension Service gives us some tips on how to add some health and nutrition to the diet of a picky eater. seems to be the problem. I just don't know what to do. My eight-year-old wants to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I can't get him to eat anything else. <laughs> hmm. It can be frustrating when children want to eat the same thing every day, but it's nothing to pull your hair out over. Picky eating is common and usually only temporary if handled correctly. Younger kids may turn their nose up to new tastes and textures because their taste buds are still developing. So be patient and encourage them to try just a few bites of different nutritious foods at each meal. Choose recipes with ingredients your children like and let them be your produce pickers on your next trip to the grocery store. Suggest sweeter tasting veggies to your picky eaters, such as carrots, sweet potatoes, and squash. Give their taste buds a chance to mature, and they may be willing to try new foods in the future. 
Try this. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. For more information and ideas on how to feed a picky eater, visit the Pinterest page of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. What is one of the most glamorous plants of the southern springtime landscape? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us why the southern indica azalea is sure to draw attention. He also has an important date regarding their pruning. If there's a single shrub that could be called a staple in the southern landscape, it is the azalea. The spectacular flowering has made azaleas one of the all-time most popular landscape shrubs. It's early spring in South Mississippi and the azaleas are putting on a show. One of the earliest blooming varieties is the southern indica azalea. Whether used as specimen plants, hedges, or backgrounds, southern indica azalea has to be my favorite azalea. The blooms are huge, resembling rhododendrons, and are created in great quantities. The flowers are funnel-formed with narrow bases and bell-shaped edges. The flower colors are pinks, purples, and reds, and includes white. Many have speckles in the flower throats. Southern indica azalea has the potential to be a big plant. Pruning can keep them smaller with denser growth. Always prune after flowering, but before July 4th. The flower buds for next year are formed early in the summer. Azalea lacebug is a common insect pest and causes leaf speckling. These are sucking insects that live on the underside of the leaf and leave telltale spots of black frass. Azaleas have a shallow and fragile root system that can be damaged from excessive raking. Using organic mulch like these oak leaves is the best method to keep landscape weeds under control. You can expect southern indica azaleas to bloom in early March down on the coast to early April in North Mississippi. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Layton once again, Gary says to prune your azaleas after flowering but before July 4th. In our feature segment today, we'll look back at the year 2012 in Mississippi agriculture. There was drought, but fortunately not in Mississippi. Time now for the markets with Layton. You say the new cattle on feed report is out? That's right, the April 24th numbers confirm again the problem in the beef sector that traders are talking about. That story coming up here. Also along this week, Calmain Foods is moving to cage-free eggs in a new venture. U.S. catfish processing is up, but pond bank prices are down, and cotton futures remain under pressure. Mississippi's Calmain Foods is partnering with an Indiana-based farm to build a cage-free egg production facility in northeast Texas. The state-of-the-art complex in Bogota, Texas, will utilize Roseacre Farms patent-pending cage-free systems. Calmaine President Dolph Baker says the venture not only expands egg production, but responds to the increasing customer demand for cage-free eggs. The first production at the new operation in Texas is expected in August. Pond bank catfish prices in the U.S. take a drop in the new monthly update on aquaculture. In March, producers in the U.S. received a pond bank price of $1.14 per pound for premium size live fish. That is three cents per pound less than was paid a year ago in March. Farm sales topped 29 and one half million pounds, an increase of 1%. Processor sales, meanwhile, headed the other direction, dropping 8% from March 2014. That total, 14.6 million pounds. April 21st was jokingly called Turnaround Tuesday in the cattle sector. Futures were higher after some days of losses. Market watcher Tom Fitzenmeyer is not surprised at the recent break in cattle. Numbers are low, which he says is symptomatic of a problem he and others are definitely concerned about. Now you're starting to see a few, few heifers being pulled out, which sort of adds to the tightness. On the other hand, do we... How, do we are we really going to function with cattle 100 bucks higher than hogs? Really? How long is that going to last? I, I, I just don't think it is. Poultry prices are low. Um, I, 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 exports, not good because of the strength in the dollar. We're importing cattle. None of that is good for the cattle market. 
And something else not good for the cattle market, the recommendation recently from the government's Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. That committee's report to USDA and Health and Human Services removes lean meat from the definition of a healthy diet. Now in response, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association has a campaign underway to keep beef in the center of the plate. And it's going to be a great opportunity for cattle producers and all interested individuals to send their comments both to USDA and to the Department of Health and Human Services and let them know that any final guidelines that come out have to have beef still at the center of the plate. That's our big goal. We're going to be um, really behind the eight ball in making that happen. So we need some grassroots engagement to really submit those comments, generate some uh, pressure behind this and make sure we get beef restored to that center plate uh, scenario. Time to break for the trivia quiz on Farm Week. And here is the quiz question. Where in the U.S. is the pine tree state? Is the answer A, Alabama, B, Georgia, C, Mississippi, or D, Maine? You'll find out in a few more minutes. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span reports growers might want to pay attention now to pricing their soybeans. We'll also hear concern over China in the cotton market. In the feature segment today, we'll look back at the year 2012 that was dominated by the drought and animal rights. From our family to yours, Mississippi's farmers believe the best produce and livestock are grown right here at home. With ms.foodsearcher.com, you're only a click away. Using your smartphone, you'll be connected to hundreds of families and small businesses dedicated to providing you with fresh local foods. Produce, meats, fish, dairy, agritourism, community markets, and more are right at your fingertips no matter where you are. ms.foodsearcher.com. Now, before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Mississippi State University will host its Beef Unit Field Day on Saturday, May 2nd. It takes place at the Beef Unit headquarters on the South Farm in Starkville. The hours are 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Lunch is provided. Breeding, nutrition, genetics, and stalker cattle health and management are among the items on the agenda. That afternoon, the Mississippi Cattlemen's Association will host Beef Day at the MSU-LSU baseball game after the field day. Please call to reserve a plate. Mississippi State University will hold a golf course management short course on Wednesday, May 18th. Location is the Dancing Rabbit Golf Club at Philadelphia. The hours are 8.45 a.m. to lunch. The cost is $50. That includes lunch and a round of golf. Converting to Bermuda grass greens and ultra dwarf Bermuda grass management are among the items to be covered. Participants can get recertification credit for Category 3 and Category 10 applicator licenses. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. We turn to row crops now in the markets. Recent rains are likely to push additional acres to soybeans as the planting date for rice draws near. At least that's the opinion of Arkansas Farm Bureau economists. Meanwhile, analyst Elaine Cub says that with weakness in corn and ample global supplies, soybeans will have a difficult time maintaining gains. In fact, she says it's more urgent to be selling beans rather than corn right now especially because you have the large supplies from South America that farmers there have still been holding off on their sales. So there is more of a threat that you could get a big movement of, of physical soybeans coming onto the market and, and pressuring prices lower. That's, that's the threat, yeah. I mean, they're they've been holding off, and so that is a big cloud over the soybean market that the corn market doesn't share. We wind up the markets now with a check of the cotton market. There, the focus continues to be largely on China and what is or isn't happening with that economy. I talked to Extension Ag Economist John Michael Riley on Tuesday. John Michael, as we record this segment, cotton has been losing a few points. What's got it under pressure right now? Well, I think the biggest thing that's, that's got cotton a little bit worried is the developments in China. China's GDP, China's economy seems to be... If, Fragile might be the best word there. I think there's a lot of uncertainty about where where that economy is heading, and cotton obviously is very tied to what happens in that country, both from an import and an export standpoint, especially with the U.S. So I think that's one of the biggest things that is is a bit uh, has has the a bit of a cloud over the over the market right now. 
Well, you mentioned China. That kind of brings to mind exports. And I did want to ask you, the dollar is on a strengthening trend. How is that playing with China, or how will it play with the China market? Well, typically, whenever the dollar strengthens, we expect to see our exports uh, be more expensive for our friends overseas. Um, and so, typically, cotton has moved, had an inverse relationship with the dollar. Uh, here lately, we have seen that, that relationship become a positive one and almost moving very close together as the dollar has strengthened. Uh, cotton prices have gone up, and as, well, most, most likely, as the dollar has come down of late, uh, cotton prices have been coming down. So something that we don't really see typically. Uh, keep in mind, though, we export the cotton, but we also Im import the goods that are made from those, from those, uh, from spinning that, spinning that cotton. So there is a bit of a trade-off there in terms of imports and exports. All right. Uh, the USDA noted this week cotton planting behind the five-year average in the U.S. as a whole. Is that bothering the market at this point? Still. Fairly early, though, as far as planting cotton goes. It's probably not bothering the cotton market as much as it is the corn and bean market. And I think that's going to be the thing to watch moving forward is uh, if we continue to see delays, especially here in the Delta states where we do plant corn so early, where are, the, where are those corn acres if they don't eventually get planted to corn? What are they going to move to? Are they going to switch to beans or are they going to switch to cotton? So I think that's the thing to watch. So cotton could very well pick up some acres as a result of this delayed planting. Right now, cotton is, is still too early to tell. It's, it's not quite a prime planting uh, for, for, for the time being. And back to the trivia quiz now to wrap things up for this week. And the right answer is D, the state of Maine. In our feature story segment today, I had planned to bring you a story looking back over the year 2014, but due to some illness in my family, I don't have that for you, but we will have it on the air in the near future. Instead, we look back today at the year 2012 in agriculture. It was a year marked by drought, but fortunately not in Mississippi. It was also a year that saw major victories by animal rights supporters regarding hog and egg production. Some would argue the drought in the Midwest and the Plains was the biggest story of 2012, but the story with the farthest reaching consequences may have concerned livestock production. 2012 may be looked upon in the future as a major tipping point. Under pressure from animal rights groups, Major pork buyers and major pork suppliers announced various agreements that would end their production of swine housed in gestation crates. Gestation crates are metal enclosures used in intensive hog operations. Each pregnant sow is fed individually and fighting for food between sows is eliminated. The crates, however, do not allow for much movement. Many restaurant chains, including McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, Cracker Barrel, Hardee's, Sonic, and Denny's announced they would phase out buying pork from pork producers who use gestation crates. Major pork producers, including Smithfield Foods, the nation's largest, Prestige, Hormel, and Kraft Foods, were among those who announced plans in 2012 to phase out the use of gestation crates. Kroger, the nation's largest grocery chain, and Safeway, the fifth largest, announced their plans to eliminate gestation crates from their supply chain. The way eggs are produced in the United States is also set to change. Major egg producers came to an agreement with the Humane Society of the United States to switch from conventional or so-called battery cages to enriched cages by the year 2029. The two agreed to sponsor the Egg Products Inspection Act of 2012, which is working its way through the Congress. The United Egg Producers, which includes Calmain, said the joint legislative efforts were pursued to avoid disruption to interstate sales and to develop consistent national standards. Enriched cages have about twice the room per hen than battery cages. They also have different areas where the hens can perch, lay their eggs, and scratch. Livestock producers are concerned what else lies ahead in the future when the animal rights movement seeks to extend its gains. The drought was the national story that dominated the Ag News headlines in 2012. Characterized as the worst widespread drought since the 1950s, it hit the West, the Midwest, the Plains, Missouri, Arkansas, and North Central Georgia. The USDA estimates 80% of the nation's agricultural land and 60% of its farms were affected by the drought. 43% of the nation's farms were said to experience severe to extreme drought. Mississippi escaped the drought for the most part, although conditions were generally drier as you move to the northwest. NASA says global temperatures for 2012 were the ninth warmest in 132 years of record keeping. 2012 was the warmest year on record in the lower 48 states of the U.S., smashing the old record set in 1998. 
The Weather Channel says 34,000 record highs were set compared to 6,700 record lows. Nine of the warmest years recorded have taken place since the year 2000. Mississippi's row crop farmers had the best of both worlds, good yields and high prices due to the drought. Mississippi set another record for farm production value in 2012, $7.3 billion. Poultry continued its traditional dominance with $2.5 billion, 34% of all Mississippi's farm production value. High prices and high yields helped push Mississippi soybeans past forestry to second place with a record $1.16 billion in farm production value. Forestry posted $1 billion in farm production value, up almost 8% from 2011. Mississippi corn came in fourth with a record value of $891 million. Cotton moved down to fifth with $397 million in farm production value. Acres lost to corn production and low prices fueled the downward slide. Cattle and calves saw a 39% increase in 2012 to a record $329 million in farm production value. Farm-raised catfish fell to seventh, down 23% to $165 million. Competition from imports and high feed prices are still causing farmers to exit the business. Hay came in eighth with a new production value of $145 million. Wheat ninth, $134 million. Rice came in tenth with $130 million in farm production value. In other national news, the U.S. Department of Agriculture announced in January its intentions to close 259 offices and laboratories nationwide. After hearings were held, 11 of that number came from Mississippi. The closings did put a tarnish on the USDA's 150th anniversary, which occurred in 2012. It was also the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act, which established land-grant universities in the United States. Mississippi State University was one of the universities picked to honor the occasion in June at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival in Washington, D.C. Even though people, less people are working directly in agriculture today, uh, we still serve that mission as well as uh, broaden, broaden the scope of our mission to include benefits to all of, all of society as, as far as economic development, health, uh, youth and families, uh, natural resources. Mississippi's peanut industry expanded in the state with the announcement that the Clint Williams Company of Oklahoma would open buying stations in Greenwood and Clarksdale. Birdsong Peanuts of Georgia invested $3 million in its existing buying station in Aberdeen. There are now three companies buying peanuts in Mississippi. The expansion caused Mississippi's peanut acreage to jump 350 percent to 52,000 in 2012. Average yield per acre was a record 4,400 pounds, with an overall state record crop of almost 216 million pounds. Mississippi soybean farmers harvested a record state average yield of 42 bushels per acre. They planted almost 2 million acres with an overall crop of 82.3 million bushels, worth a record value of more than $1 billion. Mississippi corn farmers harvested a record state average yield of 165 bushels per acre. They planted 820,000 acres for grain and harvested almost 132 million bushels. Mississippi growers were worried that their great corn crop might fall victim to Hurricane Isaac in late August. Farmers rushed to harvest as much as they could before it made landfall. Fortunately, the storm did not cause widespread damage. The first clouds from Hurricane Isaac began to move over Webster County, Mississippi, early Tuesday morning. Grower Stan Rogers of Gore Springs, however, began stepping up his corn harvest schedule several days ago because hurricanes mean lost yield. Said it's supposed to be here Wednesday, and we like about 200 acres. So we, we're working harder trying to get it out. Expected high prices for corn and soybeans caused cotton acreage to go down in Mississippi in 2012. 470,000 acres were planted, down 25 percent from 2011. The state average yield was 970 pounds per acre, with a total crop of 950,000 bales, down 21 percent. Corn and soybeans also stole acres from Mississippi rice in 2012. Farmers harvested a respectable 7,100 pounds per acre in 2012, but they only planted 130,000 acres, the lowest in 35 years. Mississippi cattlemen set a new record for farm production value, $329 million. The drought in other areas and higher prices and a bigger state calf crop helped to set the record. Overall, the number of all cattle and calves declined to 910,000 head at the end of 2012, off 2 percent from a year earlier. High feed prices and imports hurt the Mississippi catfish industry in 2012. Water acres declined to 48,600, 
off 5% from 2011 and their lowest point since the peak in 2001. Mississippi continued to advance its reputation in next-generation biofuels. Keor announced in May that it had essentially completed its Columbus, Mississippi plant and would begin the process of bringing it online. Keor uses wood chips to create what it calls renewable crude oil, a plant three times the size of the Columbus one is planned for Natchez. A big event was celebrated in early October. Farm Week celebrated its 35th anniversary on the air. Farm Week's first broadcast took place October 3rd, 1977. More than 1,776 have followed. And of course, since that first aired, uh, Kior has declared bankruptcy uh, and has closed the Columbus plant. So we'll have to see what happens there. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, the world's most famous agricultural scientist has received another honor. Norman Borlaug is known as the father of the Green Revolution. Now he's been honored with a statue in the U.S. Capitol. In the food factor, trying to lose some weight but craving pancakes, we'll have some banana pancakes that you'll enjoy. And in Southern Gardening, the Super Tunia in the ground or in a basket, it's hard to beat. Performance and variety. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Span. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.